Greetings, my fellow scholars of the livestream! I'm Visuasath from the Cosmo Canyon Observatory, and in today's analysis, we'll be focusing on the Shinra HQ according to clips found in the Final Fantasy VII Remake theme song trailer, as well as previous trailers. It's what my apprentice supporters and above chose for this episode of Game Analysis, and thus I will provide. This covers sneaking and busting into Shinra HQ, meeting Red 13, and facing off against Hunter Gunner. However, we won't be covering Sephiroth nor Genova, as those warrant their own episode. Still, there will be some spoilers for the original Final Fantasy VII. You've been warned. Also remember that I have no knowledge of any information contained within the data mine leaks, so bear that in mind when I talk about details already revealed in said leaks. And now, a quick CCO newsflash! To speed up video production, I managed to find an editor which will help tremendously by cutting production time in half. And it's none other than the amazing Rimavel! Thank you so much for your valuable work, contributing to CCO's quest to reach the clouds. If you're now worried about quality, don't worry. You probably didn't even notice, but she already edited the rough opening movie and screenshot analysis videos, my demo playthrough highlights, and game analysis number 21 covering Wall Market. So please look forward to her future works. Alright, if you happen to like what you're about to see and learn, please don't forget to subscribe, hit the notification bell to be notified of future content, and also join our Discord server to be part of the conversation. With that being said, let the analysis begin! We will start off with the Shindra HQ building. We can see parts of the area close to the main entrance in the shot above, and possibly the side entrance leading to the infinite stairs to floor 59. There might be a door in the last frame of this shot just beneath the text to the left of the pipe. Anyway, we do see parts of the main entrance sporting a huge Shinra logo on top, which can also be seen in this screenshot from the batch released in December 2019. I have written several analysis articles about those screenshots, so if you'd like to know more about this one here, pay the livestream.net a visit and check them out. Once inside, we get a great view on the lobby area. Let's go through the similarities first. We still have the same blue and red staircases in the same order, as well as the blue see-through display containing a Shinra logo. But instead of a glass plate, it now looks like a hologram. We also get a sneak peek into the car exhibition further back, of which we get to see more in this other screenshot also covered in the same articles mentioned before. While I first thought that the blue pickup truck is our escape vehicle, we now know better thanks to the new footage from the escape. This truck here is a normal four-wheeler, while our escape vehicle is still a three-wheeler. I wonder where we'll get it from. We are also able to see the horizontal grates hanging from the ceiling, which Tifa is climbing along in the Tokyo Game Show trailer. We can see the same futuristic elements in the background. For a more detailed analysis, please refer to the aforementioned articles. Anyway, what I do like is the darker, reflective marble floor and that the third floor has the same U-shape to it and harbors a few plants as well. However, this is where the differences begin. The whole second floor is missing here. I do hope that the side room containing at this place and the shop has moved to the third floor instead. What has completely changed is the weird cross-shaped contraption in the middle of the lobby, replaced by a hexagonal information desk. At least it still has a square line around it, albeit in white. Speaking of color, the whole Shindra HQ interior is now more focused on dark colors instead of light ones. Most of the floor is now very dark, as are the sides of the stairs. And next to those stairs, they added illuminated escalators for the lazy folks. New are also those designer lamps bearing hexagonal elements with neon tubes around, just like the information desk. The red banners hanging from the ceiling are also a new addition. The upper floor now also extends along the walls instead of stopping at the stairs. Above in the light shaft, we see at least five more floors, most of them carrying catwalks, possibly for security purposes. It's interesting how Cloud turns its head to look up to the upper floor, as if to tell us where to go next. Incidentally, the stairs and escalators to the right are closed off, below and above, forcing us to take the left stairs, which lead directly to something familiar. Do you see the top of the Shinra logo and the pipe up there? The next shot contains the same two elements and another one, the beloved Hardy Daytona, which received a bit of a redesign. The front wheel seems smaller, while the back wheel now consists of two units, the exhausts look more modern and lack the bandages. The blue canister is missing from the motor, 
and the whole frame feels professionally made and covers more of the innards, which takes away from its original roughness and homemade appearance. Anyway, it looks like we're now forced to walk by Klaus' escape vehicle. At least it's still located in roughly the same spot. We've seen option 1, barging into the front door. Luckily, the sneaky option has also made it in. In this short scene, we see Klaus running up the stairs, passing floor 26 as seen on the wall. Tifa and Bert climb up the stairs at their own pace, with Tifa in the lead of course, just like in the original game. The additional numbers next to the here always visible status UI tell us which floor each of the characters is currently on. Tifa is 3 floors ahead of Cloud and Barrett 2 floors behind. The Japanese version is practically the same, just with everyone being 1 floor lower. I wonder if there's a trophy for beating Tifa in reaching floor 59, and if there are still a few items lying around in the stairwell. And most importantly, if it's still possible to run up all the way to floor 59, grab everything on the way, then run back down again and then enter through the front gate anyway. In any case, both the English and Japanese versions have been recorded at different stages in development. The Japanese version shows additional red lights on the back wall and presumably some cables along the wall close to the big red light. Next up is the cafeteria. I already thoroughly analyzed this floor in one of the articles on the livestream.net, so I won't repeat myself here. But we do get a nice view on the curved staircase from another angle, even if we don't see anything new really. Not even the elevator doors or the escalators. I'm starting to believe those lie somewhere on the upper floor where the staircase leads to. In the E3 footage, where we see a big tree in a giant glass tube, there are two NPCs of note. A gentleman checking his phone and this woman donning a big pink ribbon on her chest, gazing with an empty expression into the void, completely oblivious of a soldier first class running by with a giant sword on his back. I think we can see the same NPCs in the screenshot from December 2019 as well. The following shot shows Cloud ascending some escalators which represent the ones we use to travel between floors above floor 60. In this case, we're about to reach floor 64, as the orange number on the wall above suggests. As you might remember, floor 64 contains the gym and recreation area. In the Japanese version, we can see a smidge of the 63 below, although the Japanese footage might show a different section. When we compare this very last frame of the scene, the Japanese version exposes more pipes in the background and shows a different lighting. Even the area to the left of the railing has changed. And I don't think that's just a change between different builds. Which means the floor number below could be anything at this point. It all depends on how much this escalator area differs from each floor. Further up, we see Cloud running past an office space, separated from the hallway by glass walls. Hard to say on which floor this is. None of them in the original game contained distinct office rooms so it could be anywhere on floors 65, 66 or 67. But for now, I presume this is floor 66 with the big meeting room in the middle, partially due to that huge Shinra logo ahead of Cloud. Within the office, we see several people working, one of them even staring intently into the screen, which is funny because most of the screens look exactly the same, with the exception of one at an empty workspace, where only one of two screens is even turned on and that screen even shows the same content we see in the blue hollow screen in the lobby. Two other workstations are completely switched off and the bald guy standing next to a co-worker can either be a supervisor or a peer who is just trying to help. In the first few frames, we can spot a scientist of sorts on the other side of this office space. For some reason, that guy reminds me of Evan from the Kingdom Hearts franchise. That guy seems to be walking towards the elevators visible close by in the wall. Last but not least, we get a little sneak peek into how they'll go about listening in to the Shinra executives' meeting. They all enter the men's restroom, according to the urinals, where Cloud jumps up into the vents and can then be seen crawling through them. Though I'm wondering if Cloud goes in alone this time, or if the others still follow suit. All three looking through the same grate down to the meeting room will get messy. But imagine how funny it would be if all three of them went in and had troubles turning around, backing away and generally put a certain level of clumsiness on display. But all of that won't matter if we aren't able to flush the toilet. This feature has to be in, or else I'm gonna cancel my pre-order. During the Shinra HQ scenes, we hear a dialogue overlay pertaining to their infiltration. We're here to rescue Aerith, remember? We don't need more attention than what we're gonna get. Yeah, I hear you. Which is most likely in response to Barrett planning to barge into the front door, urging him to take a more subtle route. In the original dialogue, Barrett and Tifa are arguing about which approach to take, upon which Tifa asks Cloud which side to take. 
I imagine that, if we choose Tifa's approach to find a less obvious alternative, Cloud will reply with this line prompting Barrett to concede. Later in the trailer, we hear another dialogue line spoken by Cloud across many shorter battle scenes. I know these people, and I know they're never gonna let Aerith go. She's the last living agent on the planet. Think about what that means to Shimmer's scientists. I'm pretty sure that's a part of their dialogue while in Aerith's house debating what to do about rescuing Aerith. I haven't found a similar line in the original script, but it certainly doesn't make sense for this line to happen after they made up their mind about rescuing Aerith from Shinra's clutches. Praise be to Gaia! We finally get to see our best boy in ultra high quality and he looks glorious! It even almost made me shed tears of joy while writing this very script! And his in-game model looks even better than his pre-rendered Advent Children version, especially his mane and nose, and I think his proportions and anatomy look less awkward. How far we've come! Compared to the original artwork, he has been adapted very faithfully. The decorated side strands, the mane, earrings, feathers, red face paint, tattoo in the fore and hind legs, as well as his leg bracelets, which even bear the same pattern. His snout looks amazing, his mouth moves in a believable fashion and you can even see his beautifully and detailed rendered teeth and gums. Unfortunately, his damaged eye can be barely seen here, but it's still there. What I like specifically about his remake design are the white front of his snout and the additional black tribal tattoo on the top of his head and ears. Both additions make his design more interesting and less bland. His nose has also changed a little and instead of a lion's nose, it reminds him more of a house cat or even some canines, although those exhibit a rounder form. Red 13 still can't be distinctly classified, which is awesome. What is less awesome, however, is his starved looking frame. Besides the upper foreleg muscles, he looks very malnourished, especially on his hips and ribcage. No wonder, being a scientific subject of worst dad of the millennia, Hojo. Anyway, his neck collar is a completely new addition and even contains filled materia slots. We only see one green matching material in his trailer, but according to the action figure plush of him, available on the Square Enix store, it contains three separate slots filled with one command and one summon materia in addition to the magic materia seen in the trailer. So it looks like they changed his weapon from a hairpin to a collar, which makes much more sense in terms of materia slots. Let's now have a look at the location. We're clearly not in front of the sample tube anymore, but rather in a control room which extends into a corridor behind red. And if we look closely, we can spot parts of that sample tube beyond the windows, which leads me to believe that we're currently standing in the control room above, and to the right of the sample tube also seen in the original, which shows a similar layout, with the nose in the middle and shoulders on the sides. All three spots contain the control panels. The corridor behind is new, however, and I think the whole layout of this floor will also look very different in general, barring some known landmarks. This is also a strong indicator that the first meeting with Red 13 will probably go down differently. Or maybe just a few details. It is possible that this introduction scene takes place after getting rid of the abomination called Sample H0512, rather than before. In the original game, this introduction scene containing Tifa's line, It's talked? happens right after Hojo frees Red and Aerith by opening a tank. Cloud then tells either Tifa or Barrett to go and take care of Aerith before Sample H0512 attacks. Dialogue then continues where Barrett asks Red what he is, with Red answering in a similar fashion as in the remake. The introduction scene in the remake therefore combines both aspects of the original dialogue in the same scene. So what the hell is it? A fascinating question. Oh, did it just talk? I am that which you see before you. Nothing more. Oh, I love his voice. Perfection. Anyway, this observation leads me to the following conclusion. We arrive in this room, free Aerith and Red 13, maybe in the same fashion, maybe differently, then the battle against Sample H0512 ensues with Cloud, Barrett and Tifa fighting actively and Red assisting as a guest character. This then gives Hojo a chance to flee. But to stop more creatures from using the elevator, we need to rush up to the control room to shut it down. This would explain why we haven't had the time to be introduced to each other and this introduction scene got moved to up here. Which makes sense to me as that short introduction just before another fight already felt a little strange in the original. Now, there have been many debates online about whether Red 13 will be playable, a guest character or cut out completely. I always predicted him being just a guest character in the first game, since there's just not enough time or opportunities to properly develop Red's character. 
be it in terms of story or even gameplay, without severely messing with the story as a whole. We can even see him being a guest character during the Genoa boss fight later on. We see him attack and deal damage, but there's no UI for him and the other two character slots are occupied by Tifa and Aerith. This debate has since been settled as Naoki Hamaguchi-san, senior battle designer, confirmed Red 13 being just a guest character, giving the same reason I was espousing since my very first Final Fantasy VII Remake video back in 2017. Fun fact, we can also spot Wedge actively helping out Cloud during the battle against the two sweepers during their new Avalanche mission. In the Japanese version of this trailer, we even see him throwing a grenade, which explodes and deals 12 damage to one of the sweepers. Guest characters are definitely a recurrent element in the remake. I wonder who else will take up that role. I originally wanted to include this bit in the Sephiroth and Genova analysis, but there are a few details independent of those which I'd like to share with you right now. In this short battle scene, we witness Barrett fighting on his own against two Vargit police enemies, which only appear in the Shinra HQ building after Genoa escapes. This strange area here seems to be located somewhere underground, inside of the Shinra HQ complex, maybe even near reactor number zero, one of the locations in Dirge of Cerberus, where I suspect to be Genoa's new location, among other possibilities. But that's for another video. I keep being amazed about the faithful enemy design. The Vargit police look exactly the same, just in high definition. Even their idle animation looks very similar with only the upper arms waving about. It also looks like the array of diamond shapes down the torso are actual holes this time around. One small change I can see is the new pincer of sorts at the end of their tail. The original version showed only a single spike. I like how their six eyes are now creepily glowing in the dark. Yet another thing that has been asked and debated online was whether Barrett would still receive melee weapons and many were trepidations about this. This very small scene here fortunately cleanses our fears. Barrett is wielding his first melee weapon, the Atomic Scissors. His combat style changes up a bit, of course, as we can see his triangle action now reading over power instead of over charge. This sounds like a tackling maneuver or something similar. Combos sure differ greatly also, and certain abilities can consequently only be used by one of the two weapon types, excluding weapon agnostic abilities like Steel Skin. I'm also wondering about limit breaks. Does Barrett have a different limit break set for each weapon type? Or are melee weapons able to shoot a ball of fire too? I highly doubt it. In any case, I'm just glad that Barrett can get up close and personal in Midgar too. Alright, let's now have a quick look at the surroundings. We are definitely at the bottom of something, as the path ahead only leads upwards. I think we'll enter this area from the right, then walk up to this platform here to either grab some loot or activate the switch, Go back down and proceed further to the left, where we then climb up the ladder, cross the L-shaped platform towards where we are now, climb the stairs to yet another platform, from which multiple sets of stairs lead up to another platform out of view. A platform which is supported by those angled struts affixed to the huge metal slab in the background. It's possible we then proceed towards the back further into this cave or whatever it is. I'm also wondering if those cylinder cages are actually being used or just standing around. Each one of them looks empty. Anyway, remember the short scene in the Tokyo Game Show trailer with Barrett shooting down debris in order to proceed? Do you see the pipes and cable rails along the stone wall to the left? The same ones also appear in the English footage of the Atomic Scissors scene. However, it looks like Barrett enters this tunnel from the Vorkid police infested area, judging from the cable's position. That would mean we start at the top and make our way down instead, before entering this tunnel and getting rid of the debris. We can even spot a door to another tunnel, room or an elevator behind the debris in the Japanese version of the trailer. You might have noticed that Barrett is out of combat here and uses the search command to clear the way, which is mapped to the square button, like clouds out of battle sword swings. With Barrett being alone here, it looks like he's searching for the others in here, which leads me to believe that this segment happens after the confrontation in front of Genoa's conservation tank, where the bridge falls off and everyone else with it. I don't see any other explanation with the current information at my disposal, leaks excluded. Again, we're definitely still in Shinra HQ and Genova is most likely already on the loose, like many other monstrosities, according to the Vargit police's presence. And along comes another inconclusive location. 100 Gunner, while still an encounter in the game and definitely in Shinra HQ, isn't being fought during the elevator ride downstairs which makes sense for this new and updated action battle system. Let's gather all the details first by looking at the scenes in the theme song trailer and the Tokyo Game Show trailer and then try to find a fitting location. 
According to the light rays along the walls and the ceiling lights, this room appears to be a rectangular enclosed two-story hall. Behind Barrett in this trailer and behind 100 Gunner in the TGS trailer, we see diagonal struts on the wall as well as some plants, especially when the 100 Gunner hits the pillar. When it starts driving backwards, the wall to the right looks the same as well. This means that 100 Gunner's orientation flips 180 degrees when comparing the footage of both trailers. What's interesting is that those same walls show the same grades, pillars and light arrays separating the two floors we also see in the cafeteria screenshot. The above floor seemingly reaches even further back compared to the lower floor, which ends along the pillars. The cafeteria even features a staircase to such an upper floor, as we've seen before. The 100 gunner battle area lying to the other side of this middle piece separating it from the cafeteria doesn't make much sense, however. Which leads me to the conclusion that floor 59 or 60 have a similar base layout and wall design, and we're fighting 100 gunner there when we need to switch elevators from the one servicing the executive floors to the one servicing floors 1 through 59. In any case, we do see an elevator door behind 100 Gunner in the theme song trailer. On the floor above sits another door leading to wherever and is being topped off with this angled bluish neon tube. We also see a white square laid into the floor similar to the one surrounding the information desk in the lobby. However, it can't be in the lobby, the vehicle exhibition or the third floor behind the Hardy Daytona display as the ceiling is either too far up or too low, the walls don't match and neither does the whole interior. Let's now quickly have a look at the scene itself. It's certainly a cutscene with how it plays out, but I'm not sure if it's one outside of battle or just one between phases, as we've seen in the Scorpion Sentinel battle. The scene from the Tokyo Game Show trailer is most likely part of the battle itself. While Barrett deploys his ball of fire as part of his fire in the whole limit break attack, formerly known as Big Shot, we see Aerith and Red 13 at his side, which is the exact same party constellation as in the original battle against Hunter Gunner taking place in the elevator. Going back to Barrett's attack, his line Fuck on me! can also be heard in the E3 gameplay demonstration when Barrett emerges from the cover and starts attacking the Scorpion Sentinel. Now, when stepping through frame by frame, the attack's fireball disappears for a few frames when being deployed. Quite curious. I hope they fix this until release. As with Heli Gunner, 100 Gunner's remake design is very faithful to the original. Although he now sports 4 instead of 3 guns at the top, the original artwork also displays 4 guns, so they are definitely working off of the artworks more than the in-battle models, which I find commendable. The definitive change is the left gun, which changed to a launcher of sorts. Conversely, it still retains the hole in its main body which even glows yellow when it deploys its hidden lasers. All other details look pretty much the same as showcased in the original artwork. Although, this circular white contraption on its back has replaced the red tank seen in the battle model. I wonder what it's for? Maybe some sort of hook to save itself from a fatal fall? Or a weapon to attack enemies sneaking up from behind? Now, its two attacks we see in those two trailers, while looking new, are most likely reimagined ones from the original. There's a hidden laser attack in its moveset, where it displays the individual Gatling guns like fingers to reveal a hidden laser gun. Here in the remake, it completely hinges aside the guns in the front to reveal the laser. The other one is some sort of plasma charge-up where three floating units form a triangle connected by a green energy. This reminds me of 100 Gunner's wave artillery, which shoots a giant energy beam at all opponents, but is only used when below 533 HP and thus the other guns are already disabled. Looks like that's when the hole in its torso comes into play. And with this detailed look at the near end game boss battle also ends our analysis for today. Huge thanks again to master supporter Dachtega, who took part in the analysis and thus helped shape the content of this video. If you really like this content and want to see me grow and eventually create deep and detailed analysis and discussions in a full-time capacity, you are welcome to support me on Patreon and other platforms. Details are in the description down below. It also helps tremendously if you just leave a like, subscribe if you're new, hit the bell button to be notified of future uploads and spread the word by sharing this video around. Alright, let us know in the comments and on our Discord server if there are details we've missed and please don't hesitate to speak your mind though I implore you to keep the comment section free of any information about the leaks. Thank you for your understanding. That being said, thank you so much for attending this in-depth trailer breakdown and I hope to see you again in the next episode of Game Analysis. And always remember, stay safe and take care. Bisuvasat, signing off.